In the shimmering moonlight of summer nights, ethereal fairies emerge from their hidden realm to dance with witches in ecstatic spells. As alluring and magical as that may be, a simple gaze at a sacred spectacle will strike one with maladies that only the secret brotherhood of Kalushar can heal. My name is Radiana, and I shall dance with you into the mythical realm of Romanian folklore, where opposing forces reconcile in one of the most inspiring expressions of the primeval feminine masculine dyad, the fairies and the horse-riding cathartic heroes. Fairies in Romanian folklore are similar to Nordic elves, Slavic Vili, Celtic She, and Greek nymphs, naiads, nereids, dryads, and sirens. Unlike in some Indo-European cultures, where their nature was oversimplified and reduced to diminutive forms, in Romanian folklore they have retained their primitive animistic structure. The fairy world has survived to the present day, both as a set of ideas used to justify adversity that befalls humans, and as a set of rituals intended to avert such strokes of misfortune, along with a rich body of fairy folklore. This was possible due to the minimal impact of rich persecutions and demonological doctrines on Romanian folk religion. Our fairies today show an amalgamation of the most varied mythical and ritual legacies from ancient goddesses, agents of fate, nymphs, mythical ancestors and nature spirits to storm demons, witches or the souls of those who passed away prematurely and are now found in storm clouds. They are said to harbor hate towards those who have converted to Christianity and continue to nurture the old ways in those with magical abilities. They often appear as incorporeal, luminescent women with long hair, bells on their ankles, and veils flowing about their bodies, appealing to the desires of men. They can also appear as playful knights, to lure taboo breakers to their doom, but, more often, as a sign of warning to prevent young people from going out at night in secluded places with someone who would take advantage of them. They are polymorphic, taking varied anthropomorphic and zoomorphic forms, often as dragons or snakes. In fact, it is forbidden to kill snakes in the forest, as they are believed to be embodiments of fairies. Not merely that, but every river, forest or mountain is believed to have its own guardian fairy who appears like a large snake of 2 to 3 meters. Beyond their appearance, there are supernatural and preternatural personifications of elemental and ancestral forces with distinctive lunar and nocturnal qualities, great seductive abilities and contagious ecstatic energy. They are patrons of dance and music, reminiscent of the Menads, the frenzied female followers of Dionysus. They appear in moonlight, never alone and always in troops of three, seven or nine, flying through the air, bathing in rivers and singing and dancing in circles at crossroads, near waters, in clearings and deep forests. They are ambivalent beings, praised for their fertility, protection and healing blessings, but feared for their terrible punishments. Whilst they often act as guardian spirits, healers and patrons of cultic societies, they can also appear in storm clouds as wind demons to punish taboo breakers and make them sick. They are active and visible in our world between the spring and autumn equinoxes, nature's season of ecstasy, which they fully embody. During this time, they are said to control the atmosphere and use their divine powers to enhance the magical potency of plants, the yield of crops, and the mating of animals. However, they are considered very dangerous around the Easter and Summer Ancestor Feasts, which have been conflated with feasts of saints in the Orthodox Church. They punish those who disrespect these feasts by lifting them in spinning vertigo and dropping them down violently, causing them to become paralyzed or crippled. They also attack their cattle and households, causing storms, fires and floods. Their true name remains a sacred mystery to most, except magical people such as witches or healers. As it is a reflection of their nature and represents an integral part of their entity, it should not be spoken outside sacred time and space. And so people refer to them as Yele, an alteration of the Romanian demonstrative pronouns in the third feminine person, they or them. To appeal to their good nature, they are also called by euphemisms such as sacred ones, merciful ones, beautiful ones, blessed ones, dancers of the air, maidens of the field, empresses of the sky, enchantresses, and women of the wind. 
There are as many epithets as are feasts dedicated to them and witches who commune with them. Between Easter and Pentecost, they are called Rusali by the name of Pentecost in Romanian, which comes from the Latin Rosalia, the name of the ancient Roman festival of roses celebrated from May through mid-July. They are said to be the most dangerous during this time and recruit among their troops the souls of magical dead women who refuse to return to the other world after leaving their graves on Monday, Thursday to celebrate Easter with the living. They are said to lift those who work on with Sunday into teasing worlds and bewilder them. For fear of not being taken by them, people don't bathe in streams or rivers and rush home before nightfall where they cast protection spells and rub garlic on their doors. Their most important feast is on Midsummer or the Night of the Fairies in the Romanian folk calendar, when they bless the crops, animals, and barren women with fertile magic and imbue plants with alluring scents and healing powers. On this occasion, people call them Sânziene, referring to the divine entourage of nymphs and ecstatic witches of the Daco Roman Sancta Diana, the maiden goddess of the moon, night, hunt, wildlife, childbirth, and crossroads, who likewise guided the dead to the afterlife. Diana became synonymous with Zuna, the Romanian word for fairy, whilst her devoted followers, the Dianatic, gave the Romanian word Zanatic, meaning crazy or bewitched by the fairies. She is invoked in funeral songs to guide the dead as the old fairy or the eldest fairy, and in charms and prayers she is invoked as Irodasa or Arada, the queen of fairies and goddess of witches whose processions occur near fountains, rivers, at crossroads or in deep forests. She commands the fairies and sends them to witches who seek her favor in divination, healing charms, or to help them identify medicinal plants for healing spells. If you want to understand more about her and the Midsummer Feast, watch my video on the Night of the Fairies linked in the description after this. Many prohibitions around the fairies protect their modesty and divinity when bathing, which is a sacred time. Men and other intruders into this sacred time are rendered mute or mad upon sight. And this represents the collapse of the myth of Diana and Acteon into folk belief. The myth found in Ovid's Metamorphoses tells the story of a young hunter named Acteon who stumbled upon the goddess while bathing with her nymphs, causing them to scream and cover her. In her anger and embarrassment, Diana splashed water on Acteon, transforming him into a stag and robbing him of his speech. Filled with fear, Acteon fled, only to be chased and killed by his own hunting dogs, who no longer recognized him. Like in this myth, the fairies in Romanian folklore are said to bathe in rivers and springs on the nights between Pentecost and Midsummer, and those who glimpse at them or drink from the water lose their speech or sanity or even become possessed and pass away as a result. A simple gaze at the fairies bathing or dancing can cause one to be struck or taken by them, either in body or soul. Any intruder upon their sacred circle dance is drawn into a wild whirlwind, especially if they start mimicking their movements or refuse their invitation to dance. The fairies dance around them three times until they faint or lift and strike them down, paralyzing one of their limbs. And sometimes they dance around the intruders until they levitate and disappear forever without a trace. Other times, the fairies drive them into a trance through their music, and through inclusion in their own dance, they come to possess the person. They return their victims sick by casting them on the ground. According to an account from Romanian folklore, they will snatch anyone and lift him up in the air if he's seen them dance, or has set foot on the spot where they danced or walked, or anyone who works or sleeps alone in that spot. They will snatch the person and force him to dance with them, then let him down again, and he will have gone mad or crippled for the rest of his life. Often, those taken by them wake from the trance to find themselves crushed, paralyzed or numb. A Hungarian account describes how a swishing wind came and three women, beautiful as the sunshine, got a man to dance and dance and dance and dance endlessly until the lad collapsed. He collapsed, he could not speak, he became ill, he started panting, it was all he could do. He was way past his senses. His sound mind was all gone from him. The place where they dance remains scorched for a while. Over time, the grass grows back much darker and circled by a ring of mushrooms, and animals instinctively avoid it. Stepping into their scorched footsteps is believed to cause rheumatism, paralysis, epilepsy, vertigo, or madness. For protection, people wear belts made of garlic, basil, wormwood, and mugwort around their waist, 
or hang these herbs in their homes. To safeguard their land and cattle, they place a horse's skull on a pole, as fairies are known to greatly fear it. The common experience of taboo breakers, otherwise referred to as those struck or taken by the fairies, is a state of euphoria, frenzy and compulsive dancing, induced by their beautiful voices, songs and dances. But this is soon followed by the loss of the soul, which manifests as loss of speech, vision, hearing, bodily control or sanity. The spiritual influences of the fairies only negatively affect those who violate what is sacred, that is, the modesty, mystery and magic of the Divine Feminine. However, these influences can have positive effects on those who go away with the fairies, meaning individuals capable of entering sacred ecstatic trances or those seeking to merge with the Divine Feminine through what Plato described as nympholepsy, a form of devotional spirit possession and merging of men with nymphs, characteristic of the cult of Dionysus which prevailed in Thracia up until late antiquity. It is the same condition of the Dianatich and the so-called deluded women who, in their devotion to the goddess Diana, rode upon certain animals, following her through the wild at night as part of her divine entourage. Spirit possession by fairies is regarded as both a blessing and a curse. It can manifest as a quasi-death experience during a trance or as a temporary existence in the other world. In this state, fairies can invade the body, leading to physical consequences such as the loss of limbs or facial distortion. Being seized by the fairies can be both physical or mental, it may happen while awake or asleep, and whether the journey takes place in body or spirit does not make a difference to those experiencing it. Those who are spirited away by the fairies, rather than those merely struck or taken, are transported into a radiant and luminous realm reminiscent of the Orphic Heaven, where they too temporarily become fairies. However, this divine journey to the fairy kingdom in the other world can also mean irreversible death. Those who can make this journey back and forth are double beings, meaning they are both divine spirits and humans, a concept I'll delve into further in a future video. Humans who regularly visit the other world are not only referred to as those away with the fairies, but also as those who are fairies or turned into fairies. In some Romanian communities, women who make this journey are witches, healers and hags referred to as fallen or falling women for their shamanic ability to fall into deep ecstatic trances. Some even believe they were once fairies who transformed into witches. Historical records from local witch trials show that people accused them of exhibiting seductive fairy behavior, as they appeared dancing and singing naked in the dreams and fantasies of sick people. Until 50 years ago, such witches were widely active, and some still practice today in Serbian, Romanian and Bulgarian communities. These initiates of the fairies were mainly involved in healing, especially those who violated the fairy taboos, having learned the art from the fairies themselves. They likewise communed with the dead and often passed on messages from the ancestors during deep trances. Romanian and Serbian witches regularly did this for the community on the major feasts of the dead and during times of crisis, such as wars and epidemics. Compared to non-magical humans who sometimes walk with the fairies, these witches enter the fairy otherworld with the explicit intention of becoming initiated. Now and then, the fairy sees their chosen ones through visions, apparitions, dreams or trances induced by music and carry them to the other world, where they impart magical wisdom and teach them the use of medicinal herbs. This often starts in early childhood, after a serious illness or near-death experience, which is a common motif of primitive shamanism in traditional religions. At a certain age, they go to the fairy tree of the village in a semi-conscious state and begin an ecstatic dance which can last up to nine days and nights. These initiates eventually become the healers of their community, under the patronage and assistance of fairies. It is said that every witch knows the true names of nine fairies, which should not be uttered randomly or in profane contexts, for they can activate dangerous spells or enchantments. However, in the right combination, they produce healing charms and blessings. To heal those afflicted by fairies, witches make sacrifices of milk, honey, wine and bread in the sacred places where taboos were broken, or at the fairy tree during the feasts of the fairies and the dead, such as the Pentecost week, midsummer, or after a week, month or year from the onset of the disease. 
the offering of sacrifices is often preceded or followed by a ritual invocation of the fairies. Some witches dress the patient in white and sit them in a quiet spot inside a circle they draw while they whisper prayers to the fairies and recite spells over them in a chanting voice. In a state of semi-trance, they request the fairies to withdraw their harm and restore the patient's health in return for the offerings. The patient usually spends the night thereafter at the spot or, at other times, the healer will sleep at the location with the patient. During sleep, they both have vivid dreams after which the patient recovers. Their most powerful cure, however, is the water of winds, which the fairies teach in a trance or a dream. But in some cases, even this may not be enough. And so, people seek the help of Kalushari, a brotherhood of dancers under the patronage of the Queen of Fairies and a mysterious horse god who can heal all fairy maladies with mesmerizing dancing and cathartic rituals. In 2005, the traditional Romanian dance of Kalushal was introduced to the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage List. It shares similarities in choreography and costumes with other European folk dances, particularly the English Morris dance, which suggests that it may have originated from the same Indo-European cult. Also known as Kalush, the sacred dance is considered magical in Romanian folklore, and it has been preserved as a form of ritual storytelling and artistic apotropaic performance, especially in the historical regions of Transylvania and Wallachia. A notable historical record from these areas describes a captivating performance in a feast organized on the 19th of October 1599 by the Prince of Transylvania, Sigismund Bathory, in the honor of the family of Michael the Brave, the Voivode of Wallachia. The record describes how 12 pillars were planted in a circle, and on top of each was placed a plank of 2 square meters. On each plank, a kalushar was dancing. At a certain moment during the dance, all the kalushari jumped from one pillar to the next, exchanging their places simultaneously. As a grand finale, each pulled a rope at the end of which was attached a large piece of canvas. On it stood their leader, who was gradually raised from the ground. As he neared the top, with a sudden jerk of the canvas, he was tossed high in the air. The Moldavian prince Dimitri Kantemir also attested the Kalush in his Descriptio Moldavia of 1716, where he wrote that the Kalushar in the area, dressed in women's clothes and wore on their heads wreaths made of mugwort. They decorated themselves with flowers, they spoke with feminine voices, and in order not to be recognized, they covered their faces with white linen. Each had a sword ready to slay anyone who dared to uncover their faces. They knew more than 100 different dances, and some of the steps were so marvelous that those who danced did not seem to touch the ground, as if they were truly flying in the air. They slept only in churches, for, they said, if they slept elsewhere, they would be tormented by the mischievous fairies. The simple folk credited them with the power of driving away many diseases. The dancers have since disappeared in the Moldavian region. However, a belief recorded in 1932 speaks of similar guardians, who watched over the community during Pentecost and protected it from mischievous fairies by walking all night in the fields, through the gardens, and crossing the furrows of the peasants to protect them. In the historical regions of Transylvania and Wallachia, the Kalush ritual is still performed between Ascension and Pentecost in the Orthodox calendar, which coincides with pre-Christian fertility and renewal festival between the spring equinox and summer solstice, some of which are dedicated to the liberator of the sun, the horse in the Romanian folk calendar, which the dance is named after. According to ethnologist Yonginoyu, Kalush is an Indo-European Kabbalin god, protector of horses and of the hot season of the year, that is born and dies at Pentecost. At the advent of Christianity, the mysteries of Kalush were performed at the spring equinox during the birthing and the mating of the horses in March-April. To give Christians space to commemorate the death and resurrection of Christ at the spring equinox, the scenario of the annual death and rebirth of the horse was pushed out of the Easter cycle as such, sent to others horses in the first week of the Great Lent and the Kalushar at Pentecost. In the ceremonial Kalush, the role of the horse god is interpreted by the mute who has two characteristic effigies, the flag and the beak. His divine entourage is a severely hierarchical masculine herd, consisting of a master, apprentice and kalushari, which, through the traditional costume attire, such as spurs at the feet and sticks placed in a cross on the chest like a harness, 
and the imitation of the stomping and galloping during the dance is trying to mimic a herd of horses. The mute, who wears a traditional elder or goat mask, has a wooden phallus tied to the belt with which he fertilizes, by a simple touch, barren wives. In some areas of Romania, Kaluj is also referred to as Zo, archaic regional for Zeu, which means God. When they enter their covenant, the Kalushari vow on Zo to honor the sacred mysteries and traditions of their society. This ancient traditional ethos is reflected in today's common language, as Zo is used to express one's commitment and can be translated as I mean it when used at the end of a statement. The region where this denominator spreads overlaps territories inhabited by Thracian tribes, including the Dacians, who were known to worship a god named Sabazios. An otherwise Dionysiac deity, he was often depicted on horseback and wielding a staff of power. His effigy, the hand raised in the auspicious gesture of the Latin blessing adorned with symbols linked to the underworld and the deceased, was mounted on poles and carried by his skull during processions, akin to the practices of Kalushari. Scholars believe that some elements of the Kaluj dance originated from the cult of Sabazios, while others originated from a secret war and fertility cult dedicated to the Roman god Mars. The word Kalush itself means little horse and gag, an object traditionally made of wood placed in the horse's mouth, symbolizing the silence and secrecy of the dancers. It is derived from kal, the Romanian word for horse, which comes from the Latin caballus. Noting this, historian of religions Mircealiade added that a wooden horse head, partially or wholly covered, is carried by one of the dancers, and these facts must be kept in mind while investigating the origin and function of the dance group because, symbolically, the horse inspires some of the most daring choreographic and acrobatic movements. Sociologist Gail Kligmund noted that elements of Kalush have been inherited from the Koli Sali, the leaping priests of god Mars in ancient Roman religion. They were twelve chosen youths dressed as archaic warriors, with an embroidered tunic, a breastplate, a short red cloak, a sword, and a spiked headdress, and they also wore garlands of white ribbons and wheat sheaves. They were charged with the twelve bronze shields called Ancilia, one of which was said to have fallen from the heavens in the reign of King Numa. Nymph Egeria, who was the consort of King Numa, prophesied that the people who had the shield would rule the earth, and so, at her behest, eleven copies were made to protect the identity of the sacred shield. The Sali, whose name is a double form of salire and cognate with saltare, meaning to dance, jump, or leap, made a procession around the city each year in March, telling religious or historical stories through their dancing and singing. Horus and others described them stamping their feet and leaping through the air. Plutarch also described them chanting and dancing with a quick rhythm. He also wrote that they would beat daggers on shields to create music. Ovid, who related the story of King Numa and the heavenly shield in his fasti, found the Salian hymns and rituals primitive, outdated and hard to understand. Ancient cultic and ritual elements are still present in the Romanian tradition of Kalush. Embodying the divine herd of the solar horse god, the group of Kalushar performs sacred dances, healing rituals and the symbolic reenactment of his life and death. Although some group members are long-standing, Novice dancers are accepted two or three weeks before the ceremonies begin. During this time, they train in a secluded spot in the forest, learning the traditional choreographies and mastering how to jump through the air with their legs stuck together. Once elected by the master to join the divine herd, they enter a sacred covenant. For their oath, the dancers gather in their secret spot or at a crossroad and perform a ritual called the Binding of Kalush, which symbolizes the birth of the horse god. Meanwhile, the master creates a ritualistic flag made from oak, hazelnut or lindenwood with either a green or white handkerchief at the top and strands of garlic and wormwood attached to it. Traditionally, the flag is blessed by a fallen woman or a fairy witch. And after consecration, the flag must always be held upright by the master as failure to do so is believed to result in the dancer's demise. Then the initiation ceremony begins. The novices, each holding their wooden staff or club, are dressed in the ceremonial attire of the herd and adorned by the master with spurs and bells on their feet. Standing in a circle around him, the men chant their vows in a choir while holding the flag of Kalush together. They vow on their ancestors, cattle, horses and zo to respect Kalush and its law until the unbinding of Kalush on the Tuesday after Pentecost when the solar horse god dies and the festivities end. They vow to serve Kalush, and listen to the master with faith, honor, honesty, and solemnity, 
committing to dancing with the group for three, five, seven, or nine years when they would leave the divine herd or renew their vows. They also make vows of abstinence to be observed during the 9 to 14 days of Kalush, in which they would all eat, sleep, and roam the towns and villages together so that the fairies may not take them. And they would be sworn to secrecy, vowing not to reveal the sacred mysteries of their rituals to others. As the dancer and their master make their covenant, the masked mute watches from a distance without uttering a word. And at the end, they all pass under the arch formed by the arms of two Kalushar to seal the covenant. Mircea Eliade noted that, in Banat, the ceremony is carried out on with Sunday at dawn and is concluded with a sunrise dance in which the leader raises his sword upright and the first Kalushar, who carries the wooden horse head, touches it with a stick to which a small hammer is fastened at its end. In Transylvania, the ritual of oath-taking is accomplished at a place within the nine boundaries. The Kalushar, each carrying a club, stand in a circle and pray for protection to Irodeasa. When the leader sprinkles them with water drawn from nine sources, the dancers raise the clubs and, looking towards the east, knock the clubs one against the other. Finally, they go home without looking back. From then on, until the ceremonial dispersal of the group, the Kalushar stay together. No one is allowed to be alone, not even for a short period. After the oath-taking, the flag with medicinal plants is hoisted and the Kalushari are forbidden to speak, for fear of being taken by Kalush, that is, made sick by the fairies who, in this period, are referred to by the euphemism Rusali. Most of these elements are reminiscent of a Meinerbund initiation, the isolation in the forest, the vow of secrecy, the role of the flag, the club and the sword, and the symbolism of the wooden horse head. Throughout this process, the mute, also referred to as the fool in some parts, stands out as a distinctive figure. Unlike the other Kalushar, he is dressed in distinctive attire, wearing a wooden phallus tied to his belt and concealing his identity behind a helmet, war paint or a traditional mask. He also carries a mace, axe or whip, and a healing bag with traditional cures and medicinal plants. Upon embracing his role as the vessel of the horse god, he makes only one vow for the rest of his life, never to speak during the festivities of Kalush. In the past, breaking this vow was reportedly punishable by death. Although his vow of silence prevents him from speaking and joining in the chants of his brothers, the mute captivates the audience through his masked appearance and performances. He dances on his hands, climbs tall trees and buildings, and performs wild acrobatics. As a symbolic embodiment of the horse god, the mute has his own choreography during the festivity of Kalush, and he does not follow the lead of the master, often breaking away from the herd to perform foolish apotropaic acts and fertility blessings, from kissing married women in the audience to playfully hitting others with his mace. The mute is also the bearer of the beak, pecker, or hair of Kalush. This effigy of the horse god, sometimes fixed on a wooden staff if not carried in the medicine bag, is also created during the binding of Kalush and involves complex decoration processes that consecrate the object. It is traditionally made from twisted or carved wood, in the shape of a beak and the neck of a waterfowl, or with the head and neck of a horse or wolf. It can be filled with various medicinal plants and ribbons the size of each dancer. The mute carries this effigy during the festivity of Kalush, rarely displaying it to the masses, as it was believed that merely touching it could cause illness, memory loss and madness. On the unbinding of Kalush, the sacred object, alongside the flag and the mute's mask, are covered in the skin of a hare and buried deep in the secret location where they were created and where the vows of the Kalushai were made. The secrets of this object, alongside specific incantations, choreography, and other ritualistic elements of the Kalush ceremony, are only known by the mute and the master. They pass on this secret knowledge only to their descendants, sometimes in the form of a deathbed testament. Between the binding and unbinding of Kalush, the herd roams the towns and villages in their area to perform their sacred dances. The people are always eager to bear witness, believing that the dancers would bring them good luck, fertilize their crops and barren women, and heal and protect them from the fairies. Gathered around the dancers, Spectators watch as the mute guides his divine herd into a circle traced on the ground with his wooden staff. The other Kalushar gather around him as he places on the ground salt, garlic, walnut leaves, wormwood, water, seeds, and other items intended for consecration. This would later be used in folk medicine practices, fertility rituals, or healing spells. The dancers themselves carry wormwood and garlic fastened to their belts, 
and sometimes at specific moments in the choreography, they stop to chew on the wormwood leaves. Then, bound by sacred vows and inspired by the mute who appears possessed by the horse god, the Kalushar begin their dance to the sounds of bagpipes, violins, or pan flutes traditionally played by a pair of fiddlers. Their dance spirals faster and faster as the Kalushar soar into the air and stomp the ground with their feet until they are overtaken by euphoria. Their old choreography has a magical function and illustrates with each movement a face in the life of the solar horse god and his army. The dancers stomp and gallop just like horses, often leaping through the air as if they had wings. They shout war chants accompanied by the sounds of the bells on their feet, which are known in Romanian folklore to channel the voices of divinity. Their wooden staffs or clubs are believed to be the sole anchors keeping the dancers grounded as they execute flight-like movements, reflecting the euphoria of the ceremony and symbolizing the ethereal battle with the fairies. Those struck or taken by the fairies are said to shout and jump like the Kalushari without touching the earth, sometimes doing so in the audience when the dance begins. The intimate relationship between Kalushari and fairies is amplified by its paradoxical ambivalence. The divine patron of Kalushari is Irodasa, the old fairy, whose protection they seek and rely upon despite risking falling victim to her entourage of fairies and battling them through their dancing. Furthermore, they also endeavor to embody their feminine essence in times past, cross-dressing and emulating the graceful flight of fairies during their dances while simultaneously celebrating their sacred bond with a horse, a distinctive symbol of masculinity, heroism and the afterlife that fairies fear. The horse is not only a solar masculine symbol of summer and virility, but also a guide of the dead, and fairies, some of whom are said to be souls of the dead, may fear being driven by them to a point of no return in the other world. Likewise, horses became associated with agriculture, warfare and expansion, which may disturb nature spirits inherited from primitive animism who are likewise considered fairies. During the Kalush feast, these paradoxical relationships between horses and fairies play out through the performance of the mythical scenario of the horse god's birth and death, which consists of magical and apotropaic rituals. To prepare for these rituals, the dancers train, enter their covenant, abstain from intimate relationships, and stay with their herd exclusively. When they heal a patient taken by the fairies, they chew copious amounts of garlic and wormwood and push the limits of their endurance during the dance, whilst the master spits garlic onto the patient's face, which is believed to be thus imbued with healing powers. Eliade explained that the secret of this cure lies in the performance of intricate dances dedicated to the ailing individual, which culminates in solemn ritual acts. The afflicted person is gently touched with herbs and anointed with the essence of garlic, while a jug of water is ceremoniously shattered and a sacrifice is made. In the province of Oltenia, the patient is carried beyond the village's boundaries to the outskirts of a woodland, where they are positioned within the midst of the sacred circle of Kalushari. Then, Chosen by the unwavering gaze of the master, one of them intensifies his dancing with increasing frenzy. Then, at a precise moment, when the master touches him with the sacred flag, he dramatically collapses to the ground. This momentary fall, whether induced or feigned, persists for two to five minutes. As the dancer falls, the patient is expected to rise and flee, otherwise two fellow dancers swiftly carry them away from the ceremonial grounds. Eliade believed that the underlying therapeutic purpose of this act was to drive the ailment from the patient into the dancer, who willingly died, but swiftly returned to life as a reborn initiate. In the intervals between dances, and particularly on the final day of the sacred gathering of Kalush, the dancers perform a series of comical and theatrical acts. One such example involves the disappearance of a Kalushar prompting the master to send the mute in search of him. When the mute successfully retrieves the wayward dancer, some of his companions playfully thrash the soles of his feet with their clubs. The mute valiantly attempts to rescue his comrade, only to be seized by the Kalushar in turn, hoisted up on their clubs, and dramatically dropped to the ground. Playing dead, the mute is then lamented by the herd of dancers, and eventually undergoes a mock burial after being subjected to further jesting actions. After their final performance, the dancers returned to the same secret place where Kalush was born and their oats were bound. There, the master opens the medicinal bag and distributes the garlic among the dancers. He retrieves the wooden clubs from them and takes the maize from the mute. Then, he breaks the flagpole and buries the fragments alongside the horse god's effigy at the base of a tree. 
Finally, the master instructs the Kalushar to immediately scatter without looking back. Although Kalush is similar to other European folk dances, specifically in the Balkan region, Eliade noted that it has distinctive elements that make its origins rather uncertain. The scenario of the dance is both archaic and open in structure, with notable para Bund elements. Although some elements are said to be recent additions, such as the spurs on the feet and the bells, others are much older. The ritual use of the club and flagpole indicates a more archaic culture with solar symbolism that predates Christianity. Likewise, the entire series of rituals and mythical scenario points to primitive origins. And this was further enforced by how ecclesiastical authorities opposed Kalush, similarly to how they sanctioned seasonal masquerades and festivals as late as the end of the 19th century. In some regions, the performers were excluded from communion for three years. Nonetheless, the open structure of Kalush allowed the continuous syncretistic assimilation of new elements from other mythical ritual systems, revealing the inherent ritualistic and mythical ethos of Kalush, that is, paradox and ambivalence. This intriguing parallel extends to the ambivalent relationship between fairies and Kalushari, and even between fairies and Santuaderi. In Romanian folklore, the Santuaderi are said to be the seven sons of Saint Theodore, or nine supernatural entities with big teeth, manes under their cloaks, and long feet complete with hooves. They visit villages during the three nights or the entire week before Shrove Tuesday, known as the week of Santuader's horses in the Romanian folk calendar. They sing and drum, appear and disappear swiftly in the air, play tricks on humans, and deceive young women. They are said to make distressing metallic sounds, as they dance on their victims' bodies with their shod hooves or bind them with chains that cause rheumatic pains. They are also said to abduct women who work on their sacred days, and young girls are particularly afraid of them, so they do not venture outside during their feast. However, during the night of Saint Theodore, unmarried girls gather in the forest or fields where they dance around the fire and sing in unison, asking the saint to bless them with sweet lips and hair as long and healthy as a mare's tail, in exchange of an offering of bread, salt and nuts. At the break of dawn, they return to the village, gathering magical herbs and flowers along the way. These are then boiled in water, which they use to wash their hair. Saint Theodore, invoked by the girls, is closely associated with the dead and credited with discovering koliva, a traditional funeral dish made of boiled wheat, honey and nuts. Furthermore, the Saturday of the dead is called the Elders of St. Wader, emphasizing this association and the horse's role as a psychopomp. The Feast of Todorusale, observed 24 days after Easter, further amplifies this connection as fairies are said to dance, drink, play and celebrate with St. Wader's horses and offer each other bouquets of bastard balm flowers, aptly named Todruse in Romanian. Both fairies and Santuaderi embark on nocturnal journeys on specific dates, accompanied by singing, dancing and music, though the Santuader's distinctive sounds include chains and shod hooves, whilst fairies are known to fear iron. They both cause afflictions, punishing those who dishonor them, and both are mysteriously related to magical and medicinal plants, and although the Santuader embody an inherently antagonistic principle represented by the horse and iron, they are reconciled with the fairies on the feast of Todorusale. Their mythical symbolism amplifies that of Kalush. The scenario enacted by the dancers consistently involves the integration of opposites through complementary magical religious rituals. Despite the distinct masculine initiation rituals, they remain under the patronage of the Queen of Fairies, reconciling the masculine and the feminine. Likewise, their cathartic performances primarily rely on a particular choreography that ritualistically imitates the flight of the fairies while simultaneously incorporating apotropaic elements like the horse and medicinal plants for protection against them. As such, the inherent nature of Kalush is its very paradoxical ambivalence, which reconciles antagonistic principles. Sickness and death, health and fertility are personified in one of the most inspiring expressions of the primeval feminine masculine dyad, the fairies and the horse-riding cathartic heroes. Until next time, remember, on every summer night, hooves and wings take flight. Mm -hmm.